Okay, so we're going to start. So welcome everyone to the UN Behavioral Science Week. Um, our session is on the impact of judicial well-being on judges' behavior and judicial integrity. And in uh, a few minutes, we're going to have three talks. The first is by Tatiana Veras, the Crime Prevention and Criminal Justice Officer at the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime, where she coordinates the activities of the Global Judicial Integrity Network. The second talk is by Carly Shrever and Sally Ryan, uh, the Judicial Wellbeing Advisors at the Judicial College of Victoria, Australia. Uh, and then finally, we're going to have Peter Jamadar, Chair of the Caribbean Association of Judicial Officers, Judge of the Caribbean Court of Justice, and the Vice Chair of Programming at the Commonwealth Judicial Education Institute. And can I just remind everyone to mute themselves? Can everyone please mute themselves? Thank you. Great. <laughs> um, great. Okay. So um, I'm the chair of this session. My name is Tali Sherratt, and I'm a professor of cognitive neuroscience at University College London. So my work mixes in psychology, neuroscience, and behavioral economics. Um, and for the first few minutes, I'm going to share with you one example of how mental states can impact cognitive processes that are involved in judicial work. And so if you think about the work of the judge on a daily basis, um, a judge receives information either verbally or in written form, and then this information is processed by the judge's brain to form a belief, which then leads to a decision, a judgment. Therefore, the mental state of the judge is crucial because we know that the mental state will impact how information is processed and how it's used to make decision. So things like the mood of the judge, fatigue, all of these are gonna be quite important. So one thing that is especially important to consider is stress, the amount of stress that the judge is under. And this is because we know that stress really alters the way that the brain functions and it alters the way that we process information. And stress doesn't only impact those deep structures in our brain that are important for emotion. It actually impacts the function of the brain as a whole, including regions in our frontal lobes, which are really important for processing information and making decisions. And one thing that it does, it makes us hypervigilant to negative information. So let me tell you about one study uh, that we've done that kind of looks at, at how stress alters the way that we process information. We were specifically interested in how stress changes the way that we process information about risk. And we brought people into our lab and we wanted to stress them out. So these were students and we told them that they're gonna have to give a talk about a surprise topic that we will give them. They're gonna be judged and rated. We're gonna videotape them. We're gonna put them on YouTube. So our volunteers got quite stressed. Got quite stressed. They told us that they were stressed. They also, we also measured their cortisol and their saliva. When you're stressed, your cortisol goes up. And I just want to remind everyone to mute themselves. Thank you. Um, we also measured their skin conductance. When you stress, you start sweating and skin conductance goes up. And all these indicators showed that our um, volunteers were quite stressed. And once we realized, okay, they're stressed, we asked them to estimate the likelihood of all sorts of negative events happening. What is the likelihood of being a victim of card fraud? What is the likelihood of being in an accident? What is the likelihood of um, having uh, illnesses, of having the likelihood of being um, in, uh, for example, getting divorced and so on? So they put in their estimates and then we gave them information about the average likelihood in their population of having this event happen. So for example, being a victim of a car fraud can be about 70% in different populations. And then we ask them again, okay, now that you receive this information, what do you think? What is the likelihood of being a victim of card fraud? So what we were interested in is whether people will take in the information to alter their beliefs and how stress will change this process. We also had another group of participants that we didn't stress. Out. They just came in and they just did the experiment. What we found that those individuals were, that were quite relaxed, that were not asked to give a talk, they tended to disregard negative information relatively. So, for example, if someone said, I think my likelihood of being a victim of card fraud is about 30 percent, 
And we said, hey, bad news. The likelihood of being a victim of card fraud is much higher. It's about 70%. The next time around, they said, hmm, yeah, I think for, you know, for someone like me living in my city and so on, it's only about 33%. So they tended to disregard negative information. But this was completely different for people that were under stress. The more stressed someone was, the more likely they were to take in this unexpected negative information to alter their beliefs, such that those individuals who were really stressed said, ooh, in that case, 100% likelihood of being a victim of card fraud. They overestimated the probabilities. And we saw the same in firefighters in the state of Colorado. The reason that we looked in firefighters is that firefighters have days that they were quite relaxed, sitting in their station, cleaning their engines, and some days that they had life-threatening events, so they were very stressed. And we gave them our task of estimating risk and then giving them information while they were on duty. And what we found is the more stressed the firefighter was, the more likely they were to take in the information that we gave them, the negative information, and alter their beliefs. And for positive information, we didn't find any significant effect. If anything, it was the other direction. So what this means is that the more stressed a person is, the more likely they are to take in and learn from negative information. And the interesting thing is that our participants, whether it was the firefighters or the students, they were stressed for reasons that were unrelated to the information that we gave them. They were stressed because they had to give a talk. They were stressed because they had some life-threatening event happening that, that morning. And yet that stress was generalized and impacted the way that they then processed information um, in our task. So you can see how this relates to global stressful events like a market collapse or a terrorist attack or a pandemic. Under those circumstances, people get quite stressed. And so that changes the way that the brain functions and it starts focusing on negative information of which at the time there's a lot of, and that can actually cause people to become overly pessimistic and make suboptimal decisions. So for example, after a market collapse, people tend to sell their stocks rather than hold on, which is what they should be doing. After a terrorist attack, people cancel flights and get into the car, where actually driving is more dangerous than flying. And it turns out that how stressed you are also relates to how old you are. So stress starts quite low in teenagers and kids, and it goes up, 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 reaches peak in midlife, and that starts going down again. And if you look at the tendency to learn from bad news, you see the exact same pattern. The ability to learn from unexpected negative information is quite low in teenagers and kids, and it goes up, 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 reaches peak in your midlife, and then starts going down again, potentially because stress is quite enhanced in midlife. And happiness goes the other way. So happiness starts quite high and goes down, 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 reaches rock bottom in your midlife, but the good news is, is then starts going up again. So what this means is, is if an individual is stressed for whatever reason, a global event, such as a pandemic, personal event, those stress will creep into the workplace and change the way that information is processed. And so this is just one example of how mental state can affect the cognitive processes that are important for judgment and decision making. So to hear more about how judges well-being, um, why it is important and how to improve it, we're gonna turn to our next speakers. And the first speaker is Tatiana Veras. And I just want to mention uh, before Tatiana comes up that um, if you have any questions throughout the whole session, please put it in the chat. We're going to have at least 20 minutes at the end for discussion and answering questions. So do so, um, but just leave your microphones muted. Great. So Tatiana, we are going to. Hello everyone, uh, I am just waiting for the slides, one second. Uh, it is an honor to be here today and in the next couple of minutes, I would like to share with you a little bit about our work in the Global Judicial Integrity Network on the topic of 
judicial well-being and especially how well-being or the lack of well-being affects judges' ability to work, to deliver results, to be fair and to ultimately act with integrity that is expected of every judge. In case you are not familiar with the network, it is an initiative of UNODC that serves as a platform for judges and judiciaries to come together and jointly identify and address various judicial integrity and ethical challenges that they might face. We started focusing on the topic of judicial well-being during the pandemic, which as we all know, took its toll on mental health of many people. But the pandemic has also helped open the discussion on the topic. And for instance, many companies and also public offices and judiciaries have become more aware of how stress might affect their employees or public officials. But the relevance of judicial well-being and judicial stress is, of course, not new and precedes the pandemic. And in fact, already the 2007 commentary on the Bangalore Principles of Judicial Conduct, which is one of the key international standards on judicial integrity, it explicitly recognizes that judicial stress is, is an issue and should be addressed and that judges should have enough opportunities to maintain their optimal well-being. In the network, we wanted to find out how this works in reality. If judges indeed have enough opportunities to maintain their well-being, and if not, how or if it affects their work and what type of support they would need. So last year, we conducted a global survey and very recently published a report analyzing all the responses from 750 judges from 102 countries. And now I would like to share with you some of the findings. Uh, first, there are many factors that negatively affect well-being of judges, but from the survey, it seems that the most common one is very high workloads. Judges generally deal with many cases simultaneously under tight deadlines with limited time available to spend on research, which then means that judges very often have to work from home and use their free time to write decisions. Plus, it also seems that often there is a lot of pressure from the management to meet certain quotas and judges often feel that no matter what they do, they are always behind. Second, it was frequently reported that there is still a lot of stigma around mental health in judiciaries. Judges often fear to admit uh, that they are overworked, that they experience stress, as they don't want to be seen as weak or incompetent. In fact, around 70% of, of the judges said that it was still a taboo to talk about mental health and stress is experienced by judges in their judiciary. Then some other findings are that 76% of judges reported that they do not have time to maintain their physical and mental well-being. More than 90% regularly experience stress and also more than 90% would appreciate some guidance or training on how to improve their well-being. Through the survey, we were interested to learn about how the lack of well-being impacts on judicial performance, judicial behavior, and integrity of judges. And we found, as you can see, that the lack of well-being, of course, creates limitations to efficiency of justice, quality of decisions, public trust in the judiciary, access to justice, integrity or procedural fairness. And as one judge said in the survey, if judges are not functioning optimally, both physically and mentally, then of course they cannot perform optimally or interact optimally with their colleagues or court users. It was also underlined that stress, burnout, 
fatigue or anxiety are simply not compatible with the judicial values of independence, impartiality, competence or diligence. Some concrete negative consequences of frequent stress and anxiety that were reported include overall bad performance, frequent mistakes, errors in judgment, lack of concentration, slowness, even anger, decreased ability to stay open and be receptive to submissions, lack of empathy, indifference, resorting to stereotypes or biases, interpersonal problems, or even the lack of energy to try to maintain good relationships with public, such as through different educational activities. Through the survey, we also tried to increase our understanding of what judges actually need to promote their well-being. And first of all, it is to acknowledge the issue and show understanding and compassion, in particular by judicial leadership. We should remove stereotypes and stigma and instead promote dialogue and a safe space for everyone to speak. And secondly, judges need actual support. According to the survey, 54% of judiciaries provide no support. And even those that do, it is often only occasional pamphlets or occasional lectures on narrow topics such as healthy nutrition, but not much more. In fact, 97% of judges thought that more prominence should be given in the judiciary to promoting well-being of judges. And as for the forms of support that would be welcomed by judges, these include access to psychological counseling with trained professionals who actually understand the specific stressors of judicial work and also other opportunities for mentoring, coaching, team building, exercise classes, yoga or relaxation sessions, nature trips or any other activities that help remove feelings of isolation, but rather create a culture of sharing. The survey participants would also welcome training that would be tailored to the specific needs of different judicial roles, focusing on topics such as resilience, personal growth or stress management. The survey participants would also find as useful more flexibility in working arrangements, which to a certain degree was a positive side effect of the pandemic, such as the possibility to work partially from home, have more flexible working hours, better holiday policies or parental support. So the survey revealed much more than this, but in interest of time, I will stop here and you are most welcome to read the full report and to learn more about the network on our website. But in conclusion, I would like to say that there is some progress and more attention is being paid to the topic of judicial well-being in comparison to several years ago. And you will hear shortly more about good practices in Australia and in the Caribbean region. But certainly for many judiciaries, it is still a task ahead to try to foster an enabling work environment and to be aware that when people work with peace and happiness, they can concentrate better, interact better, deliver better results and achieve better performance. And also importantly, to improve trust in the judiciary and perception of the judiciary. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Satiana, for sharing the results of your survey. Um, and we're going to move next to our uh, talk, which is a joint talk by Carly Shriver and Sally Ryan, who are joining us from Australia. Thank you, Tali, and thank you, Tatiana. I was so impressed when I saw the report on the UNODC's Judicial Wellbeing Survey, and it was wonderful to hear your summary of the findings just now. The thing that struck me so profoundly was how similar the key findings are from your global survey to the findings from my own research with the Australian judiciary. 
What this says to me is that while there are many differences for judges in terms of socio-political context, legal frameworks, conditions of service, etc., um, there is a commonality of judicial experience across the globe that connects judicial officers everywhere, which is why events such as this are so meaningful. It really is an honour to be invited back to participate in a global judicial integrity net network webinar on this important topic of judicial wellbeing, specifically its impact on judges' behaviour and judicial integrity. In our short presentation, um, Sally and I want to share with you just a slice of the findings arising from my research project on judicial stress and wellbeing in Australia, and then talk about how courts and individual judges can make use of this research to support judicial wellbeing. But before we do that, I just want to say a few words about why we care about judicial wellbeing. Why is it important? Well, behavioural science research would suggest that it's important for principally three reasons. It's important for judicial officers because stress undermines an individual's psychological and physical health. It's important also for court users, including litigants, legal professionals and court staff, because Behavioural science research has conclusively shown that stress undermines our capacities for emotion regulation and impulse control, making it more likely that we will behave in ways that we later regret. And I also think it's important for the integrity of judicial decisions, and this has been touched on by Tali and Tatiana, because behavioural science also shows us that stress undermines our objectivity and critical thinking, leading to more stereotypical and conservative decisions and decisions that preserve the status quo. And just to illustrate this final point, um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with this rather famous study of parole decision makers from Israel, it's now 10 years old, which found that parole was significantly more likely to be granted at the start of the working day, after morning tea and after lunch. And as the decision makers became fatigued and depleted of blood sugar, they were increasingly likely to make the conservative status quo decisions of denying parole. So because it's important, we have to talk about it and we have to safeguard it. And to safeguard it, we have to understand what drives it. This was the motivation for my recent PhD research on judicial stress and wellbeing in Australia, which involved 152 judicial officers from five Australian courts and sought to answer these three questions. Firstly, are judicial officers stressed compared to lawyers and the general population? Secondly, which judicial officers are most stressed and why? And finally, how could courts respond? To answer these questions, the study brought together three pieces of data. Firstly, measures of stress, which included validated measures of general psychological distress, mental ill health, burnout and secondary trauma. Also measures of basic psychological need satisfaction, that is the satisfaction for our basic needs of autonomy, competence and relatedness. And more about that in a minute. And finally, judicial demographics. To better understand the drivers of judicial stress and wellbeing, we were interested in the relationships among these three groups of variables, in particular whether judicial stress levels vary according to levels of basic psychological need satisfaction or demographic groupings. For today's short presentation, I just want to say a little bit more about the three basic psychological needs, as I expect many of you are wondering what does that even mean. Basic psychological needs theory arises from a very well established and heavily researched theory of human motivation and well being called self determination theory. At its core, self determination theory contends that our well being is a function of the extent to which our basic psychological needs of autonomy, competence, and relatedness are satisfied within our environment. Autonomy refers to the need to feel authentic, self determining, volitional, as opposed to controlled, coerced, or pressured. And in essence, this speaks to the innate human need to feel free. So for judicial officers, this could mean experiencing some sense of control over workflow and work type within the context of manageable workloads. Competence refers to our need to feel capable and confident and effective as opposed to inept or self-doubting or ill-equipped. And this really speaks to our innate need to feel worthy. So for judicial officers, this could mean having the training experience and necessary support to confidently manage the cases and make the decisions that come before you. And finally, relatedness refers to our need to experience intimacy and genuine connection with others, as opposed to social exclusion and isolation. And it really speaks to our, our need to belong. So for judicial officers, this could mean feeling able to be yourself among colleagues and share uh, authentically the human dimension of judging rather than feeling the need to always be in role. And it might also include opportunities to work alongside colleagues from time to time. According to basic psychological needs theory, these needs are more fundamental than desires or ideals. They're considered 
what they call essential nutriments for psychological health and well-being. And indeed, a large-scale study of lawyer stress in the US recently found that basic psychological need satisfaction correlated more strongly with lawyer well-being than really anything else, than demographics, personal life choices, and external indicators of success and status, leading them to conclude that it may not be possible for lawyers to experience thriving without relative satisfaction of all of these needs. But we didn't know to what extent this um, was true for judicial officers, which is why we included it in the research. So the findings of the study were many and varied, as you might imagine, but for today, I just want to emphasize three of them. The first is that yes, judicial officers in Australia are stressed. This is a very real issue, and I am convinced it's, it's an issue around the globe. In Australia, their rates of general distress, burnout, and especially secondary trauma were significantly higher than the general population. However, their rates of mental ill health, so depressive and anxious symptoms, were on a par with the general population, which is dramatically lower than the rest of the legal profession, where rates of depression, for example, are about three times the national average. So this suggested that there is a stress problem among the Australian judiciary, but so far this, has, this is not manifesting as a widespread mental health problem. The second finding was that judicial officers in the high volume summary courts, so in Australia that's the magistrates courts, they're the ones that experience the most stress. There was no relationship between stress and any of the other demographic variables, including practice area or seniority. Jurisdiction alone was related to variations in judicial stress with magistrates significantly more stressed and burned out than judges. And finally, the kicker is that judicial stress was predicted by basic psychological need satisfaction, especially relatedness. In fact, magistrates' higher levels of stress compared to judges were almost entirely explained statistically by their lower levels of basic psychological need satisfaction. So there is something about the work and working conditions of the lower courts that makes it harder for judges in those courts to experience autonomy, competence and relatedness. And this was leading to measurably higher stress levels. Of the three needs, relatedness appears to be the most important for judicial well-being. This is not what I expected. It was the strongest unique predictor of judicial stress. Judges who report having a greater number and more satisfying collegial relationships, though um, those that reported feeling included, socially connected and able to be themselves with colleagues, had measurably less stress than those who felt more isolated and um, or inauthentic at work. So the upshot of all this is that if we can find ways to enhance judges' sense of autonomy, competence, and especially relatedness at work, we can expect to directly reduce the levels of stress. I'm now going to hand over to my colleague Sally to talk about the ways in which individual judges and courts as workplaces can think about enhancing judicial relatedness. Thank you, Carly, and hello, everyone. As Carly said, I'm going to speak about how to foster relatedness, as um, we know this is such a strong predictor of judicial wellbeing. Now, it's important to say at the outset that Carly and I see this task as a shared responsibility between individual judges, courts as workplaces and judicial leaders. And I'm just going to describe for a few minutes some of the examples of how these three parties can contribute to enhancing relatedness. And this is really about creating quite consciously opportunities for judges to be real and genuine with each other, to talk and connect professionally and personally. And if this is not possible, judicial officers can feel increasingly isolated and feel very heavily the weight of individual responsibility for their role. So what can courts do? Courts can develop structures and opportunities for professional and personal connection. And some examples of, um, of how this, this happens around the globe and particularly what we um, have been focusing on in Victoria is by bringing judges together through opportunities for judicial education about either legal aspects, skill building um, in court craft or quite directly through discussion about judicial wellbeing. We also um, have found the opportunities to come together in facilitated peer discussion groups to be really helpful. And so Carly and I have over the last couple of years brought small groups of judges together at similar career stages to talk about how they experience their role, to reflect on satisfactions and the challenges of being a judge. Judicial peer support's also an important capacity that courts can foster. 
And this can be done by providing education for judges about how to recognise colleagues who might be distressed, how to then have a supportive conversation with them. Some courts in Victoria also have uh, judicial officers who have a wellbeing portfolio or who are identified as having done uh, judicial peer support training. And what about judicial leaders? What's their role in enhancing relatedness? Judicial leaders are key and they help to create an environment where there's a sense of community and a real sense of belonging in courts. Judicial leaders can do this by leading with sincerity and authenticity, and as Tatiana said, a, a depth of compassion. They can help shape meaning for others by focusing attention on really meaningful and value driven aspects of the work and the role. And really importantly, they can create systems for change that can support manageable workflow and workloads for judges. They can also lead and advocate for systems of support. Um, I think Tatiana talked about this as well. So leaders can advocate for and put in place clinical and health professionals who can support judges in their jurisdictions. And finally, what about the individual judicial officer's role? What can they do to enhance relatedness? Individuals can challenge themselves to, to stamp out incivility or conversely, to cultivate civility in their own relationships. We know that negative interactions more strongly affect well-being than positive ones. So it's important to try to reduce example, try to re reduce of negative behaviours and um, attitudes that can come across in sarcasm, disrespect and condescension. Judges can challenge themselves to do that and eradicate that from their own behaviour, their own chambers and within their own courts. And on the flip side of that, they can really focus on developing high quality relationships that are characterised by trust, information sharing, self-disclosure, empathy for others and listening. They can incorporate regular and brief chances to talk to colleagues each day and have some responsibility for understanding and recognising their own signs of stress and um, proactively seeking support from colleagues and health professionals when they pick that up. We're all social beings and I think uh, safe and meaningful relationships help us to all emotionally regulate and from this position we can bring our best selves to our work. And we certainly know from Carly's research that when relatedness is enhanced through all of these different, different method, mechanisms, we can expect a measurable increase in judicial wellbeing. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Sally and Carly. We're gonna move on to um, our last talk by Peter Jamadar. And I just wanna remind everyone that after this talk, we're gonna have time for discussion. So any comments or questions, just put them now in the chat. Over to you. Thanks so much, Tari and uh, Tatiana. Um, in the Caribbean, we also did uh, in 2019 and 2020 uh, research on judicial wellness, and a lot of it uh, is corroborated by the subsequent GGIN global survey uh, and its findings. But what I want to share with you and chat about today is something a little bit different. It's related to um, behavioral science, and it's about uh, whether mindfulness as intentional awareness in could influence behavioral change in judicial officers in relation to core judicial functions in the courtroom with a focus on procedural fairness. We've already heard that procedural fairness is important in the context of judicial wellness, but this is a shift uh, in a sense but it remains within the domain of behavioural change. And as you will soon see, it's related to integrity. So, if I could just uh, continue the, to share, to, to explain to you that one of the roles that I play is as a judicial educator. I've been doing this for many, many years. In fact, right now I'm in Halifax with the Commonwealth Judicial Education Institute to run in their um, intensive study program for judges from across the Commonwealth. And the one goal of judicial education 
A significant goal is transformative behavioral change. And this for us is a matter of integrity. Integrity because if judicial behavior and judicial mindsets are not aligned with core judicial values, then there is a lack of judicial integrity. And so behavioral change seeks to bring about that alignment, and it is a goal of judicial education. The years of experience that we've had in um, judicial education, and especially in effective be affecting behavioral change, has led us to discover what we call five stages. The pre-awareness stage, and I'm just going to use bias as an easy example and entry point. Pre-awareness, which is the condition of being unaware, for example, we're unaware that we're biased about a certain area. Awareness, which of course is the condition of becoming aware. You become aware that, oh my, I may be biased in this area. Acceptance, which is the condition of accepting the validity and relevance and aptness of being biased for, in this case, the judicial function. Following acceptance, there's another stage, which is a stage of choice. And that is a stage where one freely chooses to modify and change pre-awareness attitudes and behaviors to bring them in line with what is accepted and desired values. And this is where the aspect of integrity comes in. And the fifth stage is action. Because even after choice, we still have to make the decision and to act on it. And that is taking steps to actualize one's acceptance um, uh, of the pre-awareness stage. And of course, by an act of volition and choice, taking an action to change. So that's how we see behavioral change from a judicial educator's perspective. And that's been our experience of how it happens, stages. Uh, some time ago, Scottish psychiatrist Dr. R. D. Leng made the observation that the range of what we think and do is limited by what we fail to notice. And because we fail to notice that we fail to notice, there is little we can do to change until we notice how failing to notice shapes our thoughts and deeds. And so this, of course, is speaking to the pre-awareness to awareness shift. Well, in about 2018 uh, to 2019, my, I, I, together with uh, L. Ron Elahi, who is the um, research and programming coordinator, the Caribbean Association of Judicial Officers, and Richard Jamada, who's a federal judge uh, in the United States, decided that we wanted to do some investigation into mindful judging and exploring the impact of intentional awareness in on the performance of judicial officers in the courtroom. Focus of the research was clearly on intentional awareness in, bringing together both intentionality and awareness in, and on procedural fairness. Court users, because at the end of the day, courts and judges exist to serve the needs of our customers who are court users, the public. And procedural fairness research suggests that court users have increased public trust and confidence when they have a sense of, um, of uh, voice, when they can trust authorities, when they understand what is happening, and when they have access to amenities, feel included, and so on. We used um, Ken Wilber, an American philosopher's four quadrant model. And this basically says that reality can be observed, interpreted and analyzed in four quadrants or from four basic perspectives. From the individual perspective, the inside of the individual, the inner and outer. And from the collective, that is say the community or in the context of court systems, the court system from the internal court values, systems, etc., and of course, what manifests externally. So that was the framework. Therefore, for judicial officers, the research focused on trying to make them intentionally aware about what was happening within them, what was also happening outside of them, how they were conducting themselves in court. Together with that, with their awareness about what was happening all around them in the courtroom, the environment in which judicial officers do their work, and also the inner collective, 
what were the values, whether they were cultural, sociological, systemic or ideological, that infuse the judicial culture? This is just a graphic that gives you a visual but, uh, quad four quadrant model that we applied. The research followed three basic stages. We did a baseline survey before any, anybody started anything, and that baseline survey was really to examine and try to document the levels of existing awareness in the participants. Then we give, gave two practices. One practice was intended to try and develop internal awareness and capacity, and the other external awareness and capacity. They were requested to do these two practices twice a day for a period of 27 days. And then at the end of that, uh, we administered an exit survey. It mirrored the baseline survey with some additional questions to ask about the experiences around the practice of what we called mindfulness as intentional awareness. And just to be clear, for, for the purpose of the research, mindfulness was nothing more than being intentionally fully aware, moment to moment, non-judgmentally about whatever was happening. So that's sort of within the standard definition. John Kabat-Zinn has made it very popular in the West. Key findings, 94% found the practice of mindfulness useful, but very significantly, 78% found an increase in awareness of thoughts, emotions, and behaviors. And I'm gonna try and show the significance of that to judicial function in a moment. So increases in awareness in thoughts, emotions, and behavior. And very, very encouragingly, 94% said they would be committed to continue the practice. That such was the impact on them. For the uh, cross-section of those who participated, 94% found the practice either useful or very useful. Now, judicial officers have played two primary roles. They are finders of fact and interpreters of law. We all know that those of us who are judicial officers. So what did the research specifically try to, to look at? And I'm just going to share a few, just a few little tidbits of it because time is uh, limited. In relation to perception and analysis of facts, to what extent are you aware of how your, this is the judicial officers, values, beliefs, biases, stereotypes, could affect that? Before and after, following the practice for 27 days, there were significant increases in judicial officers' awareness of how these internal values were impacting perception and analysis of facts. This was repeated in relation to interpretation and application of the law, and the findings were similar as the graph shows. Post-practice increases in awareness. One judicial officer remarked, the practice has increased my alertness to the fact that the mind easily focuses on what the person as an individual believes. It is important to be aware of this and open to other possibilities. So we see the shift that has happened for this uh, participant. Then we examined another area, and that is to say, to, how, to what extent are you aware that you are shaped and influenced by your own contextually prevailing local, social, and cultural values, beliefs, biases, etc.? And it's very important because every judicial officer comes uh, out of an environment, is inculturated into an environment, and sits in that environment. But in the modern world, where um, you know, it is uh, a, a very much multicultural, etc. We have to judge and be decision makers in relation to context, cultures, values that are different from us. And so the question was, examination was, well, to what extent are you aware of these things? And significantly, post-practice, there was increased awareness. One participant shared, it has made me much more aware of the impact of what I think and feel on what I do and the impact that has on the judicial pro process. So already we are seeing results that show that simply by the practice of um, intentional awareness in participants were becoming increasingly aware, not only of what's the, what they were thinking, but of the impact it had on the judicial pro uh, process. For us, change is premised on choice and choice is facilitated by awareness. That's the pre-awareness uh, to awareness shift. Court users, the focus of all of the work that we do ought to be, and 
in court, in the courtroom, to what extent are you fully aware and sensitive to court users? Again, the results are the same. Post-practice, much more aware. Very important because the procedural fairness research shows that if you are not aware of court users, if you're not sensitive to their needs, to give them opportunities to be meaningfully heard, to participate in proceedings, to attend to their legitimate needs, to make sure that they understand what's happening, then public trust and confidence diminishes. So this is a very important finding. Transformation, therefore, is possible. And as one uh, participant also shared, mindfulness has led to, I quote, an increase in awareness of how verbal and nonverbal communication thoughts, actions can influence how I perform my duties in the court space. Last in impact, as I said, 94 found the practice meaningful, 88% wanted to learn more, and 88 would recommend the practice. Key conclusions, these are just a few. Regular practice of intentional awareness and can lead to improved and enhanced courtroom function and experience. It can lead to marked increases in self-awareness of the internal and out and external aspects of the judicial officer's values and behavior, and also similarly in relation to court users and court systems. Clearly it can be taught because over 27 days these shifts occurred. In 2020, the Harvard Psychiatry Review published an article on mindfulness and behavior change, and this is just a little snippet from it. It concludes that there is a growing evidence base that supports the benefit of mindfulness for behavioral change. And so in a very real sense, mindfulness is speaking to self-regulation in terms of the ability to adaptively regulate attention, emotions, cognition, behavior, and to respond effectively to both internal as well as external stimuli, events, and demands and expectations. Therefore, it has, from our research, uh, clearly demonstrated that it can shift between the pre-awareness and awareness stages. It can create a shift from pre-awareness to awareness in aspects that directly impact core judicial functions, including fact-finding, interpretation of law, and sensitivity to court users, and therefore procedural fairness standards. This research, of course, is preliminary, and I think it invites further consideration. But I just thought, and I'm very happy to have had the opportunity to share it with you in this uh, Behavioral Science Week that United Nations is hosting, and to GGIN for the opportunity to share it. It does have implications for judicial wellness, but I'm not good. We don't have the time to look at that today, and I thought I would just focus on this aspect. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Peter, Tatiana, Carly, and Sally. Um, and now we have um, about 10 minutes or so for uh, some Q&A and discussion. Um, so I, I thought I'll start you off with, with a question, which is actually somewhat related to this last comment that we have in the chat. So let me just read this from Aneta. She says, greetings from the Regional Anti-Corruption Initiative. We run a summer school for young judges and prosecutors from the Southeastern Europe. Those topics are very novel and interesting and could definitely become a part of our annual training, um, which I think is great. And so my, my question is, um, can you share with us a program that's already in place or maybe just about to be in place um, in which these um, issues and principles that you just talked about are already implemented? Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I might jump in first and Sally, please join and um, it'd be great to hear from others as well. So Victoria is probably seven or eight years into our journey of trying to implement wellbeing programs and training and other initiatives for the judges of our state. And it all started with um, a, an event, an educational event, which was really an opportunity for judges to come together and speak about the human dimension of judging together. So creating the conditions where that was possible. And that then, I guess, um, created a kind of environment where we could start to explore some other topics. So um, we've looked at uh, systemic uh, responses and also judicial peer support in large programs. And part of the systemic responses has included thinking about ways of reducing the unnecessary sources of stress 
in judicial work. So some of that is looking at workload, looking at um, how different parts of the court interact with each other um, in ways that, that can create some unnecessary stress. And other parts, uh, other aspects of it is thinking about how we can support judges to manage the irreducible sources of stress in their work. And that one example, there's a number, but one example is that several courts in Victoria now have in place programs of proactive uh, debriefing and counselling so that judges and magistrates um, meet, say, four times a year with um, one of several carefully selected mental health professionals, build a relationship with them as a chance to proactively metabolise the stress of the work. But it also means that if there's an acute uh, period of, of stress that comes up either in their private life or in the work, they've got that established relationship to work through it. So that's one example. You're probably thinking of others, Sally. Yeah, my mind went to um, a day program, a full day program that we have developed for new appointees. So judges who are within the first first year of being appointed. And we, we spend a day in a small group of about 20 people and talk about different the different wellbeing domains. So think about um, the kind of occupational debate, domain, the role of being a judge, what can what are some of the stressors in that? How can what are some strategies to respond to that? Um, think about the cognitive domain, maintaining cognitive health, physical domain, the emotional domain, the social domain, and the spiritual and meaning and purpose domain. So we spend a day in a small group talking about how stressors in judicial life can play out in all of those areas and then learn strategies and Carly and I teach strategies about how to maintain health in all those areas. And what I think is really rich in those days is that people have conversations in either pairs or groups of three that really build relationships that are very open and um, they become a cohort that support each other from the beginning of their career. So um, that was one that came to mind for me. We're sort of interested in focusing on different stress points in the judicial career. And we know that early on is a, a time of a lot of challenge. Um, the middle years, of once people have mastered the role and then as they approach retirement from the bench. So we sort of think about different programs in terms of education at those points. Yeah. Tally, Come if I could just, just share what's happening in our region in the Caribbean. In the Caribbean, you know, we've been doing this in a more eclectic way, but we've been doing programs. Uh, our own research revealed that similar things. And so we've been doing interventions, but including things like uh, yoga for judges, very well received. Um, you know, bringing in mental health experts to, to have conversations. In fact, through the Commonwealth Judicial Education Institute, a stand-in program for our um, ISP, and that has been ruled out uh, in the Caribbean, has used an expert from uh, Dal Hawazi, a psychiatrist, who comes in and uh, speaks to judicial officers about these kinds of issues. And the interesting thing is, of all the programs that we have, his is always sold out. There's only standing room only, and that in itself speaks to, um, you know, when you said that judges are reticent to, 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 to speak up about this, but they turn up at the sessions in great numbers. So just to say that certainly in the Caribbean region, I, I wouldn't bother to, to, to go through the details, but we've been consistently addressing many, many levels, including body work, which uh, I suppose, as you know, is very, very important. So, yeah. Great. Thank uh, you. If I may add to this, oh, yes, so, uh, it's really wonderful to hear about uh, the experiences of Australia and in the Caribbean region. There, these are really great practices. We see at the global level that there are still many judiciaries where uh, the concept of judicial well-being is being unheard of. There is zero training provided uh, on the topic. And this is really something that in the network we want to help judiciaries. We want to promote the topic, help collect these good practices so the judiciaries that don't have yet experiences with the topic could develop some effective uh, training uh, curricula. There was one answer in the survey that I now remember where one survey participant said that he thinks that training is excellent, but 
it needs to be really practical and helpful because he's so busy that if it's only theory that he can't apply, then he would actually prefer not to undergo it because it's only additional work for him and additional stress as such. Great. Thank you for that. Um, so I think we could spend the last few minutes answering these two related questions about basically about the pandemic and how that has changed some of the work uh, of the judges. So we have the first question here from Greeley who says, we have worked with our judges on remote judging and noted the added stressors and pressures when dealing with cases online or virtually. Do you know any specific research in this area, in particular how judges need to develop how they read the, vir the virtual court and pick up on social behavioral cues? Um, and she says, thanks, good session. And then we had a related question here um, have any wellness surveys been conducted or planned to address the unique challenges of traditional work during the pandemic, working from home, working virtually, etc.? Well, I, I can again say that um, we what prompted our uh, research uh, was the, the onset of the pandemic in the Caribbean. And that, that research is available and is on our website, our findings and, and, and the impact of the pandemic. I think, um, uh, Tatiana, your research was very much focused on that. And I think you have specific questions that address that, that I suppose you will share with, with, with everyone. Indeed, Peter, thank you for mentioning that there is a dedicated chapter in our global survey uh, to the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic, also focusing on the opportunities and challenges related to the use of new technologies, working from home, uh, infrastructure that the judiciary does or does not provide, etc. I will uh, link again to the report in the chat for those who maybe came a little bit later. Yeah, the thing that came to mind for me about the pandemic and the, the unique challenges, the way we've been thinking about that in, in Victoria was we haven't done um, we haven't done survey or research about this this window of time, but we've certainly um, heard from our our judges that whilst input from psychologists and health professionals is really helpful, what they actually have wanted throughout is leaders who are able to connect with them, understand yeah. their working conditions, um, really genuinely and personally support them and link them with each other. Under be brave to ask questions about um, well-being, be brave to ask questions about um, what's really challenging and to, to directly address that. So we've been supporting leaders to feel like they have um, they have permission, authority and skills to do that piece of work. And that's that's been a real focus for us over the last 18 months. I, I think that's, that that's something worth, worth underlining because I think, you know, the mindset of the judicial officer that you are sort of perfect in a way. And so to be vulnerable is a weakness mm. or perceived mm -hmm. weakness. And I think the leadership to to open and create a safe space for the conversations mm. is, is very, very important. Uh, yes, and I agree. I agree that, you know, we have to work with the chief judges and administrators to make space and room for this because there are certainly again in our region. I know anecdotally of quite a few instances where there are persons who have um, been diagnosed with mental health uh, uh, illnesses and uh, simply will not talk about them, you mm. know. Mm -hmm. And continue mm -hmm. to work, right? And continue to work. Yes. Continue yeah. To work. They have to and work. I'll just add that um, even even before the pandemic, my experience of having worked on this topic with a range of jurisdictions, both around Australia and elsewhere, um, my experience has been that when there is the unequivocal support from the head of jurisdiction and the highest judicial echelons within the court for a discussion and and actual and a and a organized response for well-being that's where you see the change without that support it's very hard for committed judges within the body of the court to create the kind of change that's necessary uh, Vitaly, can i just say something that you know the thing about judicial leadership is 
that if the request is made just anecdotally, it's easier to ignore. And I think with the value of what's happening in Australia, I think the value of what uh, GGIN has done and even what we have done through CAJU is that because when we do our research, we send it to the what we call heads of judiciary. That's in the Caribbean region. We send our research to the heads of judiciary. And I think when it is research or evidence based, then it is much uh, I don't want to say more difficult to ignore. I think it's embraced more willingly. And so I just really want to commend as we begin to close off, I imagine, I want to really commend GGIN for doing this globally because I think this is a leverage point. This is really, a, a, a the research can be a real leverage point on this very important issue. Great. Well, thank you so much, everyone. We still have comments and questions, but um, I think we're just out of time, but um, I believe there's some uh, contact information and as well uh, information about the research and, and suggestions online uh, for people to, to connect. Uh, so thank you so much for our speakers and for um, the great questions and comments in the audience. Thank you, everyone.